All right. Hi, kids. So today, um, unfortunately, no kids are joining live, but um, I assume most of you will probably be watching later today after school or after your parents get home from work, but welcome. This is the last video for the Budding Naturalist program. Um, today's topics are going to be nature journaling and trees and then gardening with Farmer Bob, who is joining me today. So if you want to say hi, Farmer Bob. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here. That's a fun day. Perfect. So um, we'll just do a quick review. So last week we did um, the family tree and trees. So you learned a little bit about trees and you had to make your own family tree. And then we did uh, butterfly buddies. So um, today we're going to be moving on. We're going to start with videos that you, uh, that Farmer Bob made. And so you're actually going to watch the life cycle of plants in a garden. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hi everybody, I'm Farmer Bob here at the IHM Sisters Community Garden, St. Mary Organic Farm Community Garden. We're outside on a nice summer morning. I have my mask on, my COVID-19 mask on, but since we're going to be outside and keeping social distance, I'll take my mask off. But if you're with other, around other people and out in the public, other than with your family at home, make sure you wear your mask. I've got my head on now. Keep the sun out of, off of my head. Keeps my head from getting overly heated. And it's, it's a good idea if you're working in the garden to have a head on. And sunscreen, sunscreen on any parts of your body that are exposed to the sun. So here's the big overview of our garden right here. You can see how, how big the garden is. We have a gardener working out there right now this morning. Community garden. Everybody has their own little plot. We have 30 people out here with 30 different gardens, and they grow whatever they want on there. Cucumbers, beans, tomatoes, cabbage, lettuce, you name it. Anything that you like in the garden, people are growing. This is a patch of cucumber. There's five rows of cucumbers here. Later on, we'll put a stake on there and let the cucumbers grow up and we'll be able to pick cucumbers from the from the standing up instead of having to bend down. There's more different types of vegetables in here. There's some zucchinis. Here's somebody. We'll see the yellow flowers there. Those are cucumbers too. Somebody put up a really nice fence to let their cucumbers climb up. There's tiny little So just as a forewarning kids, if the video is a little faulty, we will, we do have the videos all available on our YouTube website that if you are struggling to see them in any way, you can always watch them directly on YouTube. Um, but otherwise, we'll go ahead and keep going um, just in the off chance that it's not having issues on your computer. But if it is, I apologize. We're going to keep moving forward though. What cucumbers growing on? Here's some watermelons here, and some beets. And back there is purple cabbage. One thing you should also be aware of that sometimes there's weeds. Well, not sometimes. There's always weeds that come in the garden. And you can see the weeds growing here. Here's basil. This is a type of basil too. These are beans, but all, this is all weeds here. The gardener is working to pull them out of there and then she's putting burlap bags, coffee bags, or black woven cloth to help 
keep the weeds from coming back. It's always a problem with, with the garden. Other people use straw. They weed the garden and they put straw over it and it helps keep the uh, weeds from coming back. Some people like to plant flowers. These are marigolds. Those are zinnias. You can cut those and put them in a vase in the house. <laughs> some, some people just keep their garden hoed. The, every time they see weed coming up, they take it out with a hoe and they keep it nice and clean that way. That's another way to take care of weeds in the garden. Some stakes are and strings to help keep the tomato plants going up into the air and off of the ground. That keeps the tomatoes from getting garden soil on it and that can cause rotting of the tomato. Here's a few green tomatoes starting to form right now. In another couple weeks, they'll start to turn red and we'll be able to pick those. And here's some squash seeds. This is called butternut squash. I don't know if you ever had any squash soup. The grown-ups like squash soup a lot, or baked butternut squash. These were saved from a squash last year. The squash itself has seeds inside, and you can take those seeds and save them for planting next year. That's what we have here. So we take a, we're going to plant the squash seed and follow it as it grows through the season. So the first thing we need to do is plant the seed. You can take a finger or any kind of a garden tool and make a hole in the soil, about three quarters to an inch, about up to your first knuckle. Put the seed in there and cover it up really press it down tight. You can use your hand or you can use your use your foot to squash it down. That makes sure that the soil is nice and tight around this tucked in around the soil. Seeds like to be in close contact with the soil so they all feel nice and cozy underneath the, underneath the garden soil. So here's our seeds that we planted We'll come back a week later and see what they look like. It'll take about three or four days for those to sprout and uh, poke out of the soil. Here's a little baby squash plant that came up. You can see that there's two different kinds of leaves on there. These are called the cotyledons. These are the leaves that are alive inside the seed. The seed actually has leaves inside there. And that, they'll, they'll grow like this. These are called the true leaves. And these are what will eventually become the squash plant here. This plant is about a week or two, a week to ten days old. All right here we are a week later from the last time you saw the garden. The squash are really coming on strong now. This is day number 19 since the day it was planted. So 19 days ago we put the seed in the soil and then planted rows of these squash here and you can see less than three weeks how far along they've come by next week we'll, we may be seeing some flowers on there these small original cotyledons the leaves they are they don't work anymore they're just they'll fall off in another day or two and the main leaves are growing here on the plant and they're the ones that are giving all the energy to the plant. They call that photosynthesis. Look how much bigger it is this week. It's only seven days since the last time we were here. Plants are starting to grow together. Soon they'll start sending out vines and the whole garden area will be covered with them. But in the meanwhile, we're making very nice growth. But these, these are called butternut squash. I don't know if we talked about that earlier. 
They're what's called a winter squash. And we'll check it again in another week to see what progress we're making. Hi, we're here in the garden again. This is week number four in the squash squash patch. And remember, we're growing butternut squash. Well, since last week, some things have been happening with the plant. You can see here, there's some flower buds that are starting to grow on the plant. Those little flower buds will produce baby squash. These little wiggly things coming out, those are tendrils. It's going to start forming a vine and then those tendrils will wrap around uh, different things such as posts. If we had posts and fence up here, those tendrils will wrap and uh, help the plant climb up. We're just planting the plant on the flat ground on the soil, so the tendrils really don't do too much for us. This is probably a good time to show the different parts of the plant. The roots, of course, are underground. Here's the main stem. This is the petiole of the leaf, the little stem of the leaf. Here's the leaf blade, the regular part of the leaf, the upper part of the leaf, the lower part of the leaf. Tendrils, as we said earlier. And then the beginning of the flower buds. And these will actually form yellow flowers. And after those flowers are pollinated by bees, they'll start forming the fruit. So that's where we are, are at at week four. If you take a look at the entire patch, you can see how much growth it's made since the last time we were here. Hello! We're here on the, in the garden, the last, the last week that we'll be filming, taking videos here of the garden. We're back in the same squash patch here, butternut squash. So this week we're seeing some of the squash plants starting to actually form squash. Look here, here is the, here's an old flower that was pollinated. And look here, there's a little squash plant starting to grow. Here's a flower that's going to open soon. Or it, it, it has already opened and been pollinated and then is also growing a squash, a small squash there. These flowers will shrivel up and dry and fall off because they've done their work. They've, they've pollinated um, the plant and uh, are forming the squash. So as a forewarning everyone, um, my computer is having a bit of internet issues, so if the video is freezing, I again sincerely apologize. Um, like I said, I will post, I do have videos on the YouTube account and we can always share those as well. So, but we'll keep going, just seeing the off chance that it, again, isn't freezing. Pollination happens, it happens, it happens in two, two stages. One part of the pollen goes to pollinate the seeds, and the other pollinates the fleshy part, which is the squash part that we eat. So that's, uh, and that, that's what we're seeing here. Now, looking around in the squash patch here, I see in this direction over here, there's some little bit bigger squash. We'll take a look at that and see if we can see what they look like as they get older. Let me just part these leaves. Oh, look at here. Can you see this? Squash plant there, look at that. And look at the flowers come off. Look how much bigger it is. So these will be growing very quickly now until fall when we, when we finally harvest them. Uh, so they're uh, they're just starting. They're just on their way, and uh, we're happy to see that. There's going to be dozens and dozens of these in this in this squash patch here. Hopefully, we'll uh, have no problem between now and the time we harvest the squash. Okay. So that was stop, stop sharing. So that was the video of it's following some squash seeds, squash seeds. And now that we have Bob here, he actually brought some plants. So we're gonna unmute him. Sorry, kids. Having 
some technical difficulties today, unfortunately. So. All right. How's that? That sounds better. We're getting a little Okay. Well, we're at the we'll get the sound figured out here. The sound figured out here. The sound Okay. All right. Okay, we're better now. Okay. Just pretend that we're in a big canyon, and you you can hear the echo, echo, echo. All right. So you heard me say. Many times in the in the was a nut squash after all. Turned out to be an acorn squash. What happened was somebody last year saved seeds and uh, were, were happy to give us seeds for the garden to grow squash, and they accidentally put the wrong name on the envelope of seeds that they gave us. So that's a very important thing. If you decide to save seeds from your plants from year to year, always keep the proper name with the plant right away so you don't forget what kind of plant you have there. So we did discuss about where seeds come from from planting in the garden and we said that we saved them from the plant last year and that's uh, exactly what happened. This acorn squash is ready to eat now and so what we can do is we cut it in half and inside there are seeds. I was going to try to cut it in half with my little knife here, but this, I don't think we're going to be able to do that very easy, easily where we're at here when we're doing this video. Other plants, the same thing. If you want to get seeds from them, the same thing happens. For example, cucumbers. This is going to be a little bit easier to open. I'm going to just open it, open it up, and you'll be able to see. And I'm sure you've eaten, most of you probably have eaten cucumbers. But you can see the seeds starting to form in there. So all this, these are actually cucumber seeds. This is a pretty big cucumber, bigger than what you would normally like to eat. Although some people eat them at this size. The thing is that the seeds start to form and then they get very tough and chewy and the skin gets very tough and chewy. Uh, but that's because the plant is starting to produce its seeds for reproduction. There's a sunflower. We grow those out in the garden too. Sunflower seeds are formed right in this brown area here. We have other flowers there. Remember I was talking about the marigolds? I'm looking at my box here. The marigolds will start to form seed right under this area in here. The flower gets pollinated, seeds start to form there, and then people can pick the seeds and save them for growing marigolds next year. The other thing with pollination is things like cucumbers and squash, they need require, they need insects like honeybees and wild bees and other kinds of beetles and insects to help pollinate them. If they don't get pollinated properly, there's a problem. You see this one here, it's a nice cucumber shape, right? Looks like a regular cucumber. If it, the pollination doesn't happen properly, you end up with cucumbers that look like this. 
That means part of the plant was not pro properly pollinated. That could be from not enough uh, honeybees around. It could be from a weather problem or a disease problem, but that is a pollination problem. This kind of a cucumber is still okay to eat. It just looks funny, which is why you don't see them in the store. You'll see that in the garden quite a bit though, if you grow your own cucumbers. You save pepper seeds from peppers. Peppers start out green and then they turn red. When they turn red and start to shrivel up, the seeds are ready to, ready to harvest and save for, for next year. And so you can save the seeds and eat the good part on the outside. Same with tomatoes. You've seen the seeds in tomatoes. I was going to open up this one, but it's very gooshy. We're going to have, we'd have tomato juice all over the place. But there, you know, you've seen tomatoes with tomato seeds in there. Those are the exact seeds that we use for planting in the garden next year. Other things grow in the garden too. Oh, wait a minute here. Here, here is, let's go back to the marigold. This is what I was looking for. Here's a marigold. Started out like this. And is drying up and forming dry seeds inside there. So right in here is where the seeds are. You could try to open it up and see what happens. Oh yeah. You open it up. Can, we, can you see that? Marigold seeds. Let me hold them hold them still so that you can see it. Those are ready to save and plant for next year. You can buy them in a store like this. And they'll look very similar to this. Take off the little, what they do is they take the little brown part off. But you don't have to do that for, for saving marigold seeds at home. Sunflower seeds are harder to save because the birds like to eat sunflowers. You put sunflower seeds in your bird feeder at home. Well, they will eat them right from the flower before you can save them. So you have to cover them with a paper bag or something like that to keep the birds away. Let's look at this one, see if we can find any seeds. There may or may not be. I picked that just this morning. There are a lot of birds out in the garden having breakfast. You no, know, there's some little green, unripe seeds that the birds didn't even like. They're waiting for them to turn into sunflowers too. So I'm going to be covering some of these with a paper bag and we'll save seeds for next year. And what else grows in the garden? Well, there's, that we didn't have here yet. There are all kinds of different vegetables and things, but there's also weeds will grow in the garden. Weeds also produce seeds and that's where we get the seeds, the weeds in the garden that come up from their own seeds. This is a, Pigweed, pigweed plant. Seeds here are very small. There'll be thousands of seeds on each plant that will drop into the garden and form a new weed for the next year. Here's a type weed. This is called foxtail. All the seeds are in here. This will turn yellow and brown and seeds will fall down into the garden again and then produce more seeds for plant uh, weeds next year. Here's a funny one, pink flowers. This is also a weed, kind of fun, nice looking, but uh, this is called smart weed, same thing. These are teeny tiny little flowers and each one of those flowers will form a seed and you get hundreds of seeds dropping into your garden, which is why it's very important to keep the weeds out of your garden and not let them start producing seeds. Because when they do that, they'll have fresh seeds, have more, more weeds in the garden next year. It's very important to keep your garden weed. Let me look and see if there's anything else in my cardboard box. I don't see anything else in there. I think that's all I have from the garden today. There's a lot more I could have brought in, uh, but uh, that's all I have for this morning. Anybody want to add anything, ask any questions? If you can, we don't, we don't, I don't think we have anybody here with us live, but you can probably uh, get a hold of some way and get some questions, 
answered. Or in the, right, type in the comments, exactly. Uh, the garden is, uh, we are now, when we're, when we're doing this video, this is like the first, second day of September. So the garden is being harvested. Um, a, lot of, a lot of vegetables are coming out of the garden right now. The plants are starting to get tired from producing all the vegetables. They're not as green as, and bushy as you saw at the beginning of the year. Starting to turn a little light green and maybe even some plants yellow. Some plants have even stopped. Uh, they don't necessarily grow all, all season. Most plants do. The plants will grow until what we call the first frost, and that will be around here sometime in October. We'll have our first frost, and that means our first temperatures that get down below freezing. And when that happens, the garden is completely done, and we'll uh, till it up and put it to bed for winter. And that's our season, then we'll start it all over again next spring. Just so you know. Oh, there's the audio problems again. Okay, so um, we're going to gallery. There we go. All right, so what we're going to do next is um, we're going to have a video done by Sister Anne where she talks a little bit about garden tools. Um, and after that, we're going to do a song together. We're going to sing the parts of a plant song. So um, we're going to switch over to the video with, I have audio on my video on my computer. Um, we're going to switch over to the video with Anne. Welcome everyone. I'm so happy that you could come here today to our IHM Organic Farm. You know, I'm a senior citizen, but I've been working at this farm for five years. And I always wear either my straw hat or a visor because I don't want to get sunburned when I'm working out here. Also, I wear my garden gloves just to protect my fingers when I'm digging around in the soil. So, I would like to introduce you to our tool shed, our garden tool shed. And it has all the kinds of tools that you would like to use in the garden. I have some to show you today, but first I would like to open the door of our little barn for you. I'm going to... Somebody gave me the secret code. You always have to have a secret code when you put in the barn. So I'm sitting in the secret code right now because you're all allowed to come in here today. There we go! And ta -da! <laughs> There's our barn where we protect all of our tools that we work with. We use them and keep them clean and borrow them and then we put them back in the same place where we found them. And today I would like to show you a couple of tools that I bring with me every single day. It's the hose. We have many hoses in here. We have more in there but we have a short hole. Some people like that one. Some people like the regular hole that many of the farmers and gardeners use out here. But my favorite hole of all holes is the worn hole. It's called a worn hole. You know, I don't know why they call it a worn hole. The farmers of about, and gardeners of about a hundred years ago, called this a worn hole, and they like this hole too. Do you see what kind of a shape it has? Yes, I heard over here somebody said triangle. It is, and it's wonderful for 
digging into the ground a nice straight line I want to show you a straight line that this hole can can do for you very easily if you want to plant a garden at your house I'll just make a little garden to show you but all you do is put that little triangle point in the ground pull a nice straight row you see how it holds up on each side and then you can take beans or flowers or any kind of vegetable that you want and it gives you a space so you can put one in and then you put it, leave a space of about five or six inches put another one in that way they can grow and become bigger plants and produce more beans and I'll just put four in for today to show you how this worn hole can make a nice garden for you you pull in the dirt softly to cover the seed both sides isn't that nice and then you pat it down gently so that the the plant can grow. So thank you for coming to get the lesson on our warren hole. Some people call it a hand shovel, but it's really a trowel. Now, you, you'll know that word for the future. When you see a little shovel like this, it has a handle on it, you call it a trowel. And it's a very easy way to get under your vegetables and get all the weeds out of there and dig them out without upsetting the plant. The plant can stay there, the tomato plant can be there, and yet I can get all those little weeds from underneath the plant and the plant can grow better without the weeds. And it gets, goes under them very easily and sometimes I have a plant that gives me a hard time and I have to pull it out like that. That's why I wear gloves. <laughs> I need to get down on my knees a little farther so this little this little bench becomes a kneeling bench and that way I can reach the plants a little bit better because I can get closer to the ground to get, get the roots of the plants so they don't come back with them. Oh, I have more here than I ever thought I had. Oh, that's good. This trowel does a good job on getting out these weeds. So if you have a garden, be sure you take care of the weeds or they'll take over on all of your plants. Thank you very much. These are my zinnias. And they were growing very well until the Japanese beetles came along. And they like to have Thanksgiving dinner every night. You can see where the Japanese beetle had eaten the leaves. And we tried to keep them away, but then we had to take a little bit of soapy water so that when the beetles came, the beetles don't like to take a bath. So when we saw a beetle, we would just squirt it like that. It would fall on the ground and not go back again to the same plant. So now you can teach to other, other people those correct words for the garden tools. Thank you very much and come back again to my garden. Okay, so you got to meet Anne. She is one of the sisters here at IHM. Um, if it was a little difficult to hear her, I apologize. The weather started getting pretty bad while we were recording that day. Um, but again, we have all these videos available on our YouTube page and I'll be sharing them on our Facebook page little by little so that way if people want to watch it, they can. Um, so moving into the last part of the garden section, um, we're going to be singing a song together, parts of a plant song. Um, something else that you actually got in your packet that I want to just quickly go over together is you got this plant song so you can sing it at home. 
you also got one of these three sheets. And with these sheets, we encourage you to draw on them. We would like for you to try and draw your garden or a favorite plant. Um, but honestly, it could be anything you want, but it's a little frame so you could post, put it on your fridge or um, give it to someone else. So you have that. And we also sent you home with some seeds of your own. So we would love to see pictures of these planted seeds as they grow. And so um, we really would love to see that. And so right now I'm gonna share my screen again and we're going to sing together for the plant song. So this is parts of a plant. And so I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the Muffin Man song, but it's gonna to be to that beat. So it's gonna be, uh, we're gonna start here in a second, but how you would start out would be, oh, do you know the parts of plants? And then, so we're gonna keep going. So Farmer Bob and I are gonna sing it together and hopefully when you watch this later, you'll join in or you can sing it with your family later. But um, we'll start it here in, Oh, do you know the parts of plants, the parts of plants, the parts of plants that make you know the parts of plants that make them grow and grow? The roots they hold, the plant in place, the plant in place, the plant in place. The roots they hold, the plant in place, soak up water and food, food and water, sorry. The stems move water up the plant, up the plant, up the plant. The stem moves water up the plant, bring water to the leaves. The leaves soak up the rays of sun, the rays of sun, the rays of sun. And help them make the plant make food. The, the flowers grow into a fruit, to a fruit, into a fruit. The flower grows to a fruit, which holds the tiny seeds. Now you know the parts of plants, the parts of plants, the parts of plants. Now you know the parts of plants that make them grow and grow. So you can sing that at home. We didn't do the best job, but we did pretty, we did fine for not practicing. Probably. You'll probably do well, much better than us. But um, yes, you can sing that together with your family at home. We'd love to sing. If you want to make a video of you singing the song, that would also be great. But um, as of right now, um, that's all we have for the garden part. We're going to be moving into the nature journaling here in a second. Um, but we wanted to have you say thank you to Farmer Bob. He's going to say goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm going to try to put my microphone back up. Okay, goodbye, everyone. We're not going a little bit. I'm glad you're able to see part of our garden. And I hope I'll be able to see you again soon. Until then, happy gardening to everybody. All right. So he's just saying goodbye again. We had some audio difficulties a little bit this time, but um, we're really happy that he could join us today. So. Moving into the next part of the video, we're going to be switching into a video by Sister Camille again. So she did our video last week on uh, family trees and uh, trees. And so um, today you're going to learn about trees a little bit more, about why they're beneficial, about some tree ID. And then we're going to talk about our nature journaling books. So we made these and sent them home with you. They have various pages for you to be able to use um, and plenty black of blank pages so you can use those as well. So um, we hope that you can use the nature journaling books that we sent home. But while we get situated, we're going to go ahead and switch over to Sister Camille's video. Oh, and just as a side note, so for those parents, we will be having a gardening tips with Farmer Bob video that I'll be posting on our Facebook page today. So that way, if you, just because it's more geared towards adults, but if you have a garden of your own, 
you can use it to make sure you kind of are more successful with your plants. Because I know, I know for myself, I have a garden at home. And when he was talking about the cucumbers, I had no idea. I actually have cucumbers that look just like those little stubby ones. Um, and so it's something you learn, uh, some, you learn something new every day. So we're gonna go ahead and start Sister Camille's video. Hello boys and girls, I'm back again. And we're gonna continue what we began, learning all about our friends, the trees. There's so many things we can learn. Now this little display are just some of the leaves that I picked right here on the property. I just went around and found all kinds of them. There's a, a, a Bradford pear, there's a red maple, a ginkgo that looks like a fan. This is a red pine, a little bit like your Christmas tree, and a burr oak, a red maple, a sugar maple, a red oak, a mulberry, and a common ash. Now I couldn't bring the trees, so I cut the leaves off the tree so that you had some idea of the variety. Just like bugs have a variety in animals, so do trees. And on here, I just drew something very simple, which is the shape, which you might like to do in your journal. If you take a walk around, you could draw some of the leaves you see. At the bottom, now the leaves are pretty easy, but we have other seeds. We have acorns that we read about in the book that come from the trees. Kev are little seeds that fall off the trees. Or helicopters. Yeah, and some have a pod. And it's usually brown and it hangs like the leaves would. And then everybody knows cones because around Christmas we see these cones. Apples have seeds right in the middle. And some leaves are compound. You get one branch with a lot of leaves on it, not just one. One of the thoughts I had, because you have to play detective, is walk around your house or go to the park with your mom or dad and see how many different trees you can find. And maybe in your journal, you can draw the leaves or you can draw the shape of the tree. Is it tall and skinny? Is it round and fat? And just start looking, because a lot of times we don't look, we don't see. And then I thought it would be a great idea because I did it first. Take your journal and walk around your whole house and maybe outside your house and jot down all the things that you can make with the wood of a tree. I'll give you three of mine. You can make a baseball bat. You can make medicine with trees. And do you know we can make cups and plates with trees, paper cups and plates. Those are three things in my house that I found. So you need to go out and explore. Go around your house and start jotting down. If you can't write it, draw it. And that'll be a lot of fun. The next thing I want you to notice in a tree is it has a trunk. Now, not like an elephant, but sometimes it looks like an elephant's trunk because it's all wrinkly. But some are on the ground. We have one here that the roots are way down. That's a real different tree. And some have a lot of branches. And some have fruit. And some have leaves. They all have bark. And even the bark, if you look at the trees, this is the bark. It's the stuff that covers the stems. And some are shiny and bright, and some are all crinkly. Some of the barks even peel off. Now, the part you don't see as well, but sometimes you trip over them, is what keeps the tree standing are the roots. And sometimes you see them going along the ground. 
those are very important because they take in all the food. Oh, that reminds me. You want to see how the leaf drinks? How does it get a drink? Get a glass of water, a clear glass, and put some red food coloring and stick a brand new leaf into it and leave it there and see what happens. I'm not going to tell you. And some, some leaves, before the leaves come out in the, in the spring, you get flowers. Think of all the gorgeous flowers and the apples and the pears and the plums. Well, I'm getting excited because I love trees. So you have three assignments. Number one is walk around and see how many trees you can find and different kinds of leaves. Then you're going to explore in your house all the things made from wood. And third, get a clear glass with red food coloring and a leaf and see how the leaf is going to drink. Uh, and the last thing of all is go hug a tree because they like it. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. So kids, that was Sister Camille. And what we're actually going to do is she actually taught us about tree ID. She went over a few that we had locally here on IHM campus. Um, but what's fun is I actually sent you home with a tree detective page. It was with your, your take home packet. And I'll also attach it to the Facebook event page, but it'll help you to work on looking at things you can use to identify trees in the future. Um, there's also various websites and books you can use to identify trees, but here's a website, arborday.org slash kids and I actually chose this page because you'll get to do a quiz on how to identify tr certain trees. Now it's the same 18 trees every time they alternate them out but I went ahead and I did the test first because I know a lot of people if you don't know ahead of time it can be a little difficult but I wanted to share some of these before we went through the quiz um, which with no kids going on, I'm going to go through it here in a few minutes, but I want to review some of these uh, trees first. So to give you some hints, so pine trees. Pine trees have really long needles. So this here is an Austrian pine. So we have a, very, a few different types of pine trees that we have here in Michigan, but the needles all basically look the same. And so pine tree needles have these long, thin needles. This is a bur oak. I love bur oaks. We have a really nice grouping of bur oaks here in Southeast Michigan. And <clears throat> what's really cool, I like them, is because bur oak trees, they almost look like Halloween trees. Their branches are all over the place. But here, this leaf, um, it's really wavy. Um, it has little nuts that come out with the trees, but um, there's this nice deep indentation around the base of the leaf. And then as you get around here, it's more rounded. The catalpa, I've actually never seen one in person. So that's pretty fascinating to me, but there's a few leaves that when they, whenever I see them, it reminds me when I was a kid, I learned about cottonwoods and catalpas, linden trees, um, cottonwoods, redbuds, all of them have similar heart-shaped leaves. But when I was a kid, a t someone told me they look like an upside down chicken butt. And so when I, the first thing ever, whenever I saw those trees is I always say, oh, it's the chicken butt leaf. Now that's not actually what it's called, but that's how it reminded me of what it was. It's a cottonwood, looks like the under part of a chicken. See a little tail here. And here's the front. It almost looks like a little, but you could also say it's just a heart. Um, dogwoods, what's really cool about them is they're rounded. They have a little bit of a point at the top, but the leaves, the veins here, they round with the side of the leaf. Cedar are another type of uh, evergreen. So pines and cedar trees are both evergreen, so they don't ever lose their needles, which needles are actually leaves. They're just a different version of a leaf. They, it's just evergreens don't lose them in the winter time. And so cedars, theirs are flat and more, it almost looks like webbing in a way. So this is a cedar. 
ash. So this is actually one leaf. Um, if you put, take it off, it, oh, some people would assume this is a single leaf, but it's actually the whole thing is a leaf. It's called leaflets is what these are because it's more than one on a single leaf. Honey locust. So the leaves again are leaflets kind of similar style to the, um, to the ashes, but honey locusts, they have these sharp spikes on the branches like you see here, they hurt. If you ever see a, a locust tree, they have spikes and they don't touch them. Linden is another type of tree. I believe the other name is a basswood. Um, what's kind of cool is the leaf here, they're uneven at the base of the leaf. But again, they have that heart shape or again, the chicken butt. Then you have another ash. This one's called a mountain ash. And so this one in comparison to the other, you can see the difference. The green ash has seven leaves, but the mountain ash has uh, 13, a lot more, and they have red berries. But they look similar in their same family. So we learned about families last time. They're in the same family but they are different trees. Paper birch, so this is a paper birch. Again, another heart-shaped leaf. What's really cool about the birches, there's multiple types of birches. There's yellow, there's paper, there's gray birch. Um, there's a few other types that I can't think of at the top of my head, but there's multiple types of birches. And what's cool is if you climb to the very top, which don't do this at home, kids, but professionals will climb to the top of a paper birch tree get on the top and you can actually bend the base of the tree, the, uh, the trunk, and it won't break. It's extremely flexible. And what's cool is paper birches, the bark, when you pull it off, looks like really thick paper. Hence, it's named paper birch. The pin oak here is another oak family tree. And what's cool about this one is, again, it, the leaves look completely different but it's, it has kind of a sharper edge to the points of the leaf. There's deep indentation here, like you see here. But again, it has those nuts and it's again in the same family. It's a cousin of the burrow, or I guess you could even consider it siblings. They are very closely related. The redbud, this is one of my favorite trees. Again, it has the heart shaped, but in the springtime, they have these beautiful pinkish purple flowers. I love red buds. We're getting close to the end. Here's the silver maple. The silver maple, typically when you have this deep indentation, it's a V. Sugar maples have more of a U on this indentation, but the silver maples have very deep indentations with a V at the base. So, those are the difference, but again, they're in the same family. Sweet gums look a lot like maples, but their leaves are a lot bigger. There are huge leaves. Tulip leaves, tulip tree leaves are really cool looking. It almost looks like, if you've ever seen alien movies where they're like phone home or, or something where they make little finger movements, the tulip tree looks like you kind of did this with your fingers. So you can try and do that, it's hard. I have to kind of, you can hold your fingers together here and stretch out your other two fingers, hide your thumb, and you have a tulip tree leaf. Now they don't actually have tulips on their, on their leaves or on the tree, but that's what they're called. It actually, if you think about it, their leaves kind of look like a tulip. On the outline of it, weeping willows are another one of my favorites. Um, they have really long, thin leaves that whenever they blow in the wind, it's really I can't think of a good word, but it's just beautiful. The, the branches are really long. It's really distinguishable and you'll find them in really wet areas. The white pine, again, another pine. And you see the really long needles. So we are taking a little bit more time. So I'm not gonna do the test, but I reviewed these trees with you. So you can, I'll share this website and you can take the test at home and hopefully you get them right but you can take it as many times as you want. So 
for today. That's most of what we were going to do. Um, we ha I had some other things that we could do. We were going to review some trees. This is one you can have at home. It's similar to what you'd find in a book, a tree identification book. But um, that's something you can do with your family if you go out into the woods. Um, some other things I wanted to review with you today was things, other things you can do with your family. So this is the Oak Openings, oops, excuse me, oakopenings.org. They have a great amount of things you can do at home. They have activities throughout the year, volunteer opportunities, um, educational events. This is one that's called their Blue Week event. And so with Blue Week, this year we had to switch to virtual, just like a lot of other things, but they went to local parks and they created all kinds of recordings for you to learn. And so if you go over and hover over any of them, you can click them and watch other videos that you can learn about. So maybe you're curious about bats or maybe you want, if you've ever heard of Aldo Leopold, he's a very famous environmental writer. You could do butterfly gardens with kids, pollinator gardens. Um, but yeah, this is a really great page. You can check out all kinds of things that they have. Um, but yeah, Blue Week, the oak opening. So I said we had oaks here in the area. Oak openings is a great place. This is what you see here, a lupin plant. You'll find lupin at oak openings areas. And one of the last things I was going to do is I actually have a bunch of game pages I found online that you can use. And so my favorite one I found that I think could be the most beneficial as well as highly educational about the environment and nature topics is Plum Landing. So it's on pbskids.org slash Plum Landing. You can go to the game section, but she has all kinds of games that you can do. You can learn about wild animals you find in a cityscape. You could click that one. Let's see. Another great one is I'm sure you've heard about invasive species. So invasive species are animals or creatures, plants, anything like that, that are not originally from here. So for instance, if you were born in Michigan, you are a Michigan native. This game teaches you about uh, different animals or plants that were not supposed to be introduced to an area and took over, which is very, very bad for native species. Sometimes they outcompete them and they can't get food, which isn't good. So this is a fun game which teaches you about a few different species and it teaches you how, or well, you'll basically be removing them yourselves in the game. Then you have, let's see, what was another one I really liked? Oh, here's a couple. So this is Mountain scra Scramble. You actually create your own ecosystem. So in this, you have to try and keep a stable ecosystem. You have um, a few animals you introduce, plants, insects, but if, they, if you don't have enough food for those animals, they won't survive. So you have to make sure that it's a balanced ecosystem. Same thing with make a mangrove, similar concept, but you're making an underwater ecosystem. And, I, and then here's one for Jungle Jeopardy, same thing. And Plum just does a great job of teaching about environmental things, about animals and ecosystems. And so I highly encourage you to go on to PBS Kids on Plum Landing. And so um, for the most part, that was what I had for today. I'll go ahead and I'll say my jokes. Um, I know there's no kids to say it, but I'll wait a few seconds and say the answers. So as per usual, I'm doing one based on some topics. So today's our gardening topics. So what happens to grapes that worry too much? Any guesses? They get wrinkled and turn into raisins. So I don't know if you knew this or not, but raisins are actually grapes. They're dried grapes. So let's see. Why do potatoes make good detectives? Any guesses? 
because they keep their eyes peeled. So potatoes have these little eyes, that's what they call them, but it's where roots come out and uh, you peel a potato. So they keep their eyes peeled. And last question, how excited was the gardener about spring? Any guesses? So he was so excited, he wet his plants. Instead of pants, he wet his plants. So there you go. Some fun little jokes. Hopefully you found them funny. Um, but again, this is our last video. So I do hope that when you get home or whenever you can watch it, um, I hope you enjoyed them. Again, if the videos didn't work out, I apologize. Um, I will share them on the Facebook page so you can watch them at any time. Um, you can take pick up your take home packets whenever you want. We still have them here. Um, but hopefully you can pick them up sooner than later. And then finally, like we had mentioned to each of the participants that registered, we do have an evaluation, an online evaluation. Please fill it out. Um, it lets us know how we were doing. This is the first time we've ever done a virtual program. And we really just need to know how we did so how we can improve this in the future if we have to keep doing virtual. Um, and again, as your kids do these video, watch these videos, do the activities, please take pictures and you can either email them to me, post them on the Facebook page, um, or maybe even just mail us some printed pictures. Whatever you feel most comfortable with, honestly, it's a huge help having these pictures. We keep them on file for all of our programs. Um, but again, the evaluation and pictures would be extremely helpful. So thank you so much for watching all of these videos. Um, we really hope you enjoyed them and hopefully we see you at our next program, which our next one is an in-person beach cleanup on September 19th. Re registration is required, but again, you can find that registration on our River Raisin Institute Facebook page. So hopefully we see you all soon and have a good day.